Brian, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Uh, this is fun. You know, we got through the COVID stuff and uh, we did a bunch of these last year. Oh, and uh, it's been a while since I've been really podcasting it. So actually glad to get back in. This will be a fun night tonight because as we enter into the off season. No doubt. No doubt. So I was I was actually reviewing my notes. The one that you I think you did it with Sheets, the one that you and Joe Dillon did. And so I pulled some different questions that I thought were really good from that. And so I'm you know excited to, to get to learn from that. But that was a really good. Did you know Joe beforehand? We had met, uh, we had, and, and we had met okay. through a couple of podcasts and then through Sheets was actually the, mm -hmm. uh, the stick and ball relationship is where that started. Mm -hmm. uh, I've actually connected with Joe a few times, but no, that was an, I think we were like an hour and a half talking hitting. It was awesome. Yeah, no, it was great. Yeah. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you, uh, I, I'm excited to get to, to learn from you today. And so talking off the mic, uh, previously you're a head coach at another school and then uh, you got the Washington State job a couple of years ago, and then COVID year hit. We had some crazy stuff go on. But if we could go back to, you know, to when you accepted the job, again, you had been a previous head coach, and circumstances change, and then people change different part of the country, and you've got a brand new team with a, a new culture that's already built in somewhat, and then you're wanting to put your own spin on it. And so it's interesting because you're, you're probably, you have like this, this base and like this core information and, and this core culture that you want to bring over, but you're also getting to add new stuff based on, you know, the people and the processes that are in place that you find are really good. So I'd love to hear just your thoughts on, you know, what did the vision look like? What did you bring with you? What did you change or do differently? And just kind of walk us through your, you know, your first couple of months uh, of what you can remember. I'm sure it flew by really quickly. Really flew by. Yeah. Uh, I remember that first, at New Mexico State, the first month of, of being a head coach and, and really just being completely overwhelmed and, and really realizing, boy, I've got a lot to learn here. I'm still an assistant coach in a different seat. I need to learn how to be a head coach in this seat. But, um, you know, when that phone call rang and and all of a sudden Washington State became uh, a possibility for our family to be a head coach in the Pac-12 uh, after a great run at New Mexico State, it was, it was very exciting. But yeah, you know, going to Pullman and understanding you know, it's it's really interesting in evaluating programs. A lot of the times, if programs are down, uh, many of the times, you know, the the things that you see are are very similar. You know, and it starts with uh, locker room culture, but even before that, it starts with staff culture. You know, how stick how how really tight is the coaching staff? Are we all on the same page of what we need to do? And then how clearly are we chasing that vision of what what the vision is? And then you know, from a brand perspective. Uh, as a program, are you sticking with it? And so for us, what we were able to bring from a, you know, a cultural perspective, a, a vision perspective was we really base our staff off of about three buckets that we really try to work on and stick under. Okay. Um, number one is just our, our program pillars, you know, where everybody needs to know that. We had a Christmas party last week at the house and, um, you know, we had our trainer and we had our strength coach and we had our field maintenance crew and we had compliance and you know, everybody is involved in the program and everybody has a, a responsibility, academics. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's critical. And what I learned in New Mexico State, because I thought those pillars were about just us, uh, the coaches and the players. At New Mexico State, coming into being a first year head coach, I had had core values, core characteristics, pillars. I veered them towards the players. I quickly learned that the most important thing is that the coaching staff understands that. Most importantly, okay. it's about us first. And then we're going to send that out to our players. But I think a big thing that I've learned coming into the vision here with our pillars, which are you know, teach within a system, be, be teachers of the game, both on and off the field, inspire the community, you know, set season attendance records, get out, impact community service, do those things. And then recruit at a high level and obviously you got to develop that talent both on and off the field. So that's, that's really at the center of what we, we work to do. And then you have your core characteristics and we have our core values. Um, those were pretty similar coming in in terms of what what we were about because that was what we were about and that's what the administration was drawn to. But uh, in coming in, you know, you quickly find out that there's a lack of trust. There's there's a depletion of trust sure. in the locker room. Uh, there was a depletion of trust uh, from the coaching staff to the administration, or at least that's the perception. So when we go in, it's very important for us that, that we hammer that. So in going in, I think the first priority is is to have your vision laid out very clearly, both on your your pillars, your rules, your core characteristics, and that they're really important to you. And then do you walk the walk as a coach, as a head coach one and the staff too? But I think one of the things that I've learned 
uh, and I and I work to get better at each and every year is just to make sure that those communications are not just now only with our players, of course, they're with our coaching staff, but more importantly, that strength coach is another coach, you know, and he's got those kids three, four times a week. The academic coach is a coach. Uh, the compliance person needs to know where we're coming from, the nutrition person and all those extra resources as you raise levels. Everybody needs to know where you're coming from. And then if you can develop relationships in the sense that, you know, the maintenance guy is just as important as the strength coach, because they are, it impacts right. recruiting and impacts Absolutely. the value statement. It, everybody just plays such a critical role. And one of the really important things that I've, I'm really into right now as a coach is just investing in staff development. You know, one of our pillars is to recruit and develop. Again, seven, eight years ago, that, that pillar is maybe about recruiting players and developing players. You know, I should know better. I coached with Dennis Rogers, and he taught us very clearly that it's about developing your coaches, and then they're going to develop the players um, and allowing your coaches to coach, which is a whole other conversation, uh, which turns into, you know, defining roles. Sure. But, um, but for us, I really coming into um, our program was a defined three-year vision, no more than that. Where can we be in three years? Where should we be in three years? And I think if you lay that out and then work backwards, I think you've got a chance to really create some deadlines or some or some timelines and, and really create some accountability measures for us, the coach. Um, and that's really what we drive towards every year. And then we reinvent it uh, every year. You know, we're sure. going into year three. Uh, we have year five's vision where we should be in year five, assuming we can hit those marks this year in year three, which were our goals. Sure. No, I love hearing that. And let's hit on staff development. I know that that's, mm. it seems like a trend that is thrown around a lot, but I, you know, going into locker rooms and going into business meetings, I'm sure it's a, it's a little bit different everywhere, but tell us how you guys have been successful or at least get the ball rolling in the right direction with those. You know, I, I take a lot of pride and we take a lot of pride, but you know, we, we get the new, the, the Washington state opportunity here and, um, you know, I, I didn't get the Washington State opportunity. We at New Mexico State got the Washington State opportunity, the players and coaches. So I was really proud. Uh, when you look across the country, I think it's really neat when you see staffs like us uh, who picked up our entire staff, not just the pitching coach and the recruiting coordinator, but you're picking up a couple of student assistants and the entire family picks up and comes down because that's what we're going to be about. Um, really cool. I've learned. Yeah, it was awesome. And I take a lot of pride in that. I mean, our whole staff came with us, everybody. And uh, we, we made a we didn't make a change, but we, we lost a, a coach this year uh, who we all loved and really missed. And we replaced him with somebody who's coached and played with us again. So we've got a little mafia thing in us that we're proud of. But um, but staff development, uh, I've learned um, just over the years um, is just critical and it's critical. And, and I feel the responsibility of the head coach is to one of our pillars is to recruit and develop. Well, develop is, a, is something that we need to do starting with your coaches. So. We invest in it. You know, we've got ten thousand dollars or more um, in our light items or our fundraising items of what we do with our staff. But we have things that we do. Uh, the staff retreat is a critical component of what we do, and it's not about just going out and playing golf and you know having a few cocktails at night. It's about legitimately closing doors and working. And you know, this year was a pretty volatile staff retreat. It was awesome. Um, shows how healthy we are. We closed the doors and kind of yelled at each other a little bit and things that we needed to get off of our chest post COVID, post draft, you know, recruiting issues, all of those things. But, you know, but it was detailed and defined in terms of what we were going to talk about and everybody had the floor. Um, we've done staff retreats now for four or five straight years. I love that. Uh, they, they get bigger every year. So that, that's actually something that I will fundraise and build into our, our, our budget. Uh, that if you work on our staff, uh, the, before we meet with the players, the first thing we're going to do at the end of the summer is we're going to go on a retreat and we're going to have fun and we're going to take our wives and they're going to have fun because it is an entire family, but we got to work and we've got to come barging out of that thing. Crystal clear on where we go is really clarity is the first 10 days of the fall. We know we got a chance to veer a little bit, but we come out of there with the defined first 10 days, basically first two weeks of what we're going to do as a program. Um, and that's our culture training. And we do that with the players, but that's one thing that we do. Uh, another thing that we do, my rule, um, <laughs> this is a, it's an interesting rule, but it's just something that I believe in. I've, I've, you know, if you're a part of bad coaching staffs in terms of culture, a lot of times you find if you win, you might hang out. 
Sure. If you lose, everybody scatters. Uh, we have a rule. It's called the 90 minute rule. Um, but the rule, the winning part's easy. If we lose though, there's a rule in our staff, 90 minutes, nobody leaves. Um, and we sit together and we hash some things out so you can stay together. And that ends up being typically two, three hours, but we end up coming back the next day and we've left yesterday where it needs to be. And we're on to the next day. Cause you know, failures are part of our business, but, um, that's another staff component that we do. Uh, the Christmas party, as I mentioned, is not just with our coaching staff, but it's with our entire team. Uh, I think it's a big part of what we do. Um, and then the huge part that we do is, is we invest five to $10,000 in legitimate staff development, where we bring in leadership coaches that meet that. just with the coaches. And we go over our three-year vision. We go over our roles. We go over individually. We have, we take personality index testing. I mean, we study each other. Um, there's a lot of things that we do. We, we really have a business model. I was very fortunate. Uh, in New Mexico State, one of the alums that I met was a guy named Jerry Lujan. He's a consultant. He was a multi-million dollar insurance guy, and he just decided he wanted to go into peak performance and, and speak and consult. Luckily, he was an Aggie and he was an alum. I met with him early on uh, when we started and right when he was getting started and we got into our whys and our personality index testing and first to start with the players and then it was the coaches and we realized how important it is to know each other. And, and, and I think the last piece that I would offer up if you have any control over it is, um, is with the hiring process. I, you know, I think so many mistakes are really not about how hard we work on culture development, but really how hard we work on have making or creating the right fit sure. and making sure that people are in the right position. You know, you hire a recruiting coordinator who's, whose strength is, is a great mm -hmm. field coach. You're setting that coach up for failure. Um, right. so I, and those, those are things that I've learned as a head coach, uh, that we take a lot of pride in and it's, it's seems to roll over a little bit more, but at the end of the day, it's about relationships. It's about trust and it's about communicating as a staff. And if you could, last thing I would offer up is if there's a conference room or an opportunity to have a table in the middle of all the offices, <laughs> have that because yeah. it'll open up conversation every day. No, it's <laughs> great. And you know, I, I don't know if you've read uh, belonging by Owen Eastwood. He is um, Australian, I think. Uh, anyways, so he wrote this book that really traced belonging back to, you know, tribal instincts. And, uh, I, you know, we're still all tribal at heart. Mm -hmm. Long story long, uh, he talked about one of the, you know, the, the most cohesive staffs that he worked on was actually in a business company. And he said when, when the, and I was listening to it this morning, which I think is, is I just wanted to, to add this to what you're doing, which I think is fantastic. But he talked about how when they hired you, the CEO, the first day on the job will bring you in and tell you why, like why you, why they hired you. Like we loved your people skills. We love that you had X, Y, and Z. And then he said the next couple of hours, uh, they will go to lunch with every one of their team members and their team members will share their story with you. And so that immediately, like, you know, you're walking into a, to a place for the first time, your, your guard is up because you're like, I don't know any any of these people. But he said that, that if, if we're truly trying to create belonging, we need to have that shared trust and communication and authenticity and, and all of those things. And he said, just from day one, you're able to let your guard down and understand, okay, this is how they see my role. Here's, here, you know, here's what they think my strengths are. And now I can just go be myself within that. And I, I love that. It's very true. And if you look at even the best leagues or best programs that we've been in, some version of that seems to exist. Uh, I'll never forget uh, as a first year head coach, or as a, excuse me, as a first year assistant coach at Kentucky, um, getting to go to uh, Alabama and the SEC putting up the the coaches workshop for no matter what you were, what sport, what level. I mean, there'd be a football head coach there. There'd be a volunteer swim coach there. Uh, there'd be a trainer there and they go over, this is what we're about. And I've never, ever forgotten that. And I think as a, it's a real, it's a show as to why some conferences, some teams have real pride, have real, you know, continuous momentum, uh, and have real traditions. And, and like you said, that belonging piece, but you have to work at it and you have to teach people what it really means to be here. And, um, right. and it's a great challenge and it's a challenge annually. Sure. No, I, and I love hearing that. And it's really neat to see that you guys are bringing back, you know, former players into the program too, that, that have that. 
And so, you know, uh, is there anything that comes to mind? You know, you have a lot of a lot of people that are listening. And if you could give them like, uh, you know, I, it could be the personality test thing. I, I'm curious what you found with that. But if there was just, you know, the staff retreat was, was is a really cool thing. But from a from a development side, was there really any any one thing that your staff just absolutely loved? Yeah, there are. And, and it's really, there's, there are a lot of things. Hey, we love the retreat. I and mean, we would play a little golf there. <laughs> sure, we work really hard. Yeah, we have fun at night. But, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that we really, really look forward to because we've seen legitimate real value in it has been the understanding of self as a staff. And what I mean by that mm-hmm. is, for example, um, my why is to establish relationships that are built and based around trust. That's who I am. Um, we know all of our staffs wise, and th- that's a great start, I but love that. we really dive into each other. Uh, and you know, any of this, it's just like a, it's like a swing key. It's like a grip key on a pitching thing. It's entirely about the team and the buy-in, you know, everybody knows the right way to do things, but it's really about just how important is it to you? Well, it's really important to me. Staff culture sure. is really important to me because my greatest memories in coaching are those staffs that have been so tight. And this is primarily as an assistant, of course. But I look at the 1819 staffs at New Mexico State who won back to back championships and we were so tight, you know, and I look at University of San Diego with Rich and Sean Kenny. I mean, we were so tight. We won our first championship. Those are the great memories. But the big one is, is taking that and where we've learned is is really diving deep into us as people, um, you know, so our personality index things that we do. This might be a little deep or maybe a little challenging for for some coaches, but I think a really deep dive into your, into us as people, Brian, what really pisses you off? What sets you off? What gets you fired up? What motivates you? What do you need? What can't you have? What we do as a staff is we do this thing called the Colby index testing and and we have a consultant come in and I'll give you an example, but like coach Davis and myself are very different personalities. We're both critical to our organization as are Coach Davis and Bell and BC. And, but conflict resolution, I think, is something that is so critical from a coaching staff perspective. And this is not being soft. I think this is being really advanced in terms of if you can get ahead of what's going to irritate you. For example, I'm going to irritate my coaches if they are uncomfortable with me 15 minutes prior to what we're going to do, going with a quick veer. Or, hey, what about this? It's just my personality. I'm a kind sure. of a zigger and zagger. I'm, I'm a guy who likes to go into a room with about six bullets um, when I speak. And I want to read the room. And then I want to take those six bullets and tell stories. But I, I, I'm i not comfortable and can't read off a, a paragraph. I will, I'll blur. I'll lose it. My point is, is Coach Davis needs the paragraphs and he needs it a week in advance. So my point with that is it's very important for me as the head coach to detail what coach needs to do with regards to recruiting. That's important to me. He knows of me because I'm, I'm doing this a lot that if he needs to tie me down, he needs to come in and say, skip, I need you for five <laughs> minutes to dial in right now. And I'll say, you got it. Sure. And those are things that I think so many of us, if you look at today's political or, or social climate, you know, these things, I mean, this thing only feeds essentially what I like. So I just build up on what I like. So when I see something that I don't like, I don't even comprehend it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I could, what I would offer up would be um, get to know your staff. Um, And if, if, if we're talking about potentially hiring, uh, what I would really say is detail specifically what the position that you need is required to be successful. Mm -hmm. So then don't hunt, um, hunt. It's always about hunt people, trust, loyalty. But always, it's always a good person. And if you've got a good person and you've got his role defined and his personality is somewhat close to that, I think that person can be successful and you can create some continuity and longevity sure. with the coaching staff. No, and <laughs> I, I love that you talked about clarity because, you know, I think uh, I've, I've been trying to do like these different exercises in my head of, you know, what, what in a simple way is the, has the most impact. And there's two that I really think from a coaching side. Number one is clarity and two is belief. And there's so many things that that we could that people could argue are what are really important. But I feel like someone thinks that you believe in them, then I think that they're gonna be more apt to go above and beyond with what their expectations are for even themselves. And when they have clear expectations of what the what that is that they need to do to get better, then 
the rest is just are they putting in the work so I, I especially you know you you mentioned technology and and social media and all those things they they get pulled in so many different directions and so just being able to simplify and, and i know that that's word is used a lot but it's really hard to do mm-hmm. <laughs> and so let's let's talk a little bit about your fall because you did talk about hey we're going to plan out the first 10 weeks and there may be some pivots here and there but uh, the one thing that i've always appreciated uh, you know following you we haven't had uh, any conversations up to this point but just your ability to teach uh, concepts that are really simple but have a very large impact and so i would love to hear just how you guys you know did that this fall we we're you know we're coming to the end of it now but how how did you guys plan out this fall and you know what was your your progression of, of teaching things and just your process because I, I really want to you know dive both feet in on this yeah this is a fun topic and it's something that you evolve into or we evolve into but uh great question from my sports supervisor a couple of weeks ago he said uh well bg did you did you have a good fall? How'd you feel about your fall? And I said, well, I, I think I'll really tell you on, on January 10th when the kids come back, <laughs> yeah. you know, if they worked, yeah. uh, you know, and, and we established a legitimate routine of work ethic, but uh, we really try to simplify our fall and, and divide it honestly into like thirds. Uh, the first third of the fall is cultural um, and that's program culture, walk, talk, timeliness, dress, body language, eye contact, all those things. We spend 10 days before we even go on the field. I believe in it. You know, 10, sometimes you're like, man, I'd really like to get on the field, but love the statement of value that it makes in terms of this is really important. And the way that you walk and act and talk, um, you know, if you're going to get up and and punch out a Stanford hitter when it matters, or, you know, if you're going to get the two strike knock against the UCLA slider, when it really matters, you're going to need to have some, some belief and some moxie and, and some confidence. And, and we're going to work on that. So we do a lot of team building drills. We force our kids into uh, getting on stage, introducing themselves, introducing themselves to people in the community, going out in the community, community service. It's just a program just to, and then it's also a program just to get the guys to maybe relax and loosen up a little bit, especially the new players. So they're not concerned with being cool when we get on the field and that which can devastate a player for the entire fall. And it can be done uh, in one week. So, but we started with culture and we literally, it's a cultural phase uh, and then it becomes a mechanical phase and it really becomes very mechanical for us in everything that we do. Throwing program, ground balls, swing, I mean, tags, you name it, pitching is, it's in completely mechanical starting with just the process of the mechanics of the stretch, the mechanics of the warm up, the mechanics of catch play, base running mechanics. It's just, that's where we go for a month. And we really, that tends to be a little bit longer or bigger of a third. Um, you know, you've got a, a two week period, you've got about a seven, eight week period of, of kind of the mechanical phase. Um, Cause that's the part that they're going to work on over the break. And, and then we get into the approach phase. Um, and when I say approach, that's really by the time the end of the fall hits for us, particularly in Pullman, um, you know, we're ending with games as many as we can, you know, we have some weather here, so, we have to start a little bit earlier, but we still try to delay it as much as we can. Um, and then the, literally it becomes, you know, an offensive approach, a, a defensive approach, pre-pitch shifting, how you're attacking a hitter, understanding it, and then trying to utilize those things in the cage for adjustments and what you need to work on. You know, for example, I'm, I'm really struggling in middle counts. So how do I sit hard and react to soft or sit soft and react to hard or whatever that is. So, those are the three things that we do in terms of, of shaping our fall, but really all of it is designed to get to where we are now. Um, and where we are now is, is the next five weeks are critical in terms of have we as a coaching staff instilled a work ethic, a belief, a drive, a desire, are the kids going to have a routine? Uh, will they be working out on their own? Uh, this year we, we, we've done more than we've done in the past. You know, we have, Everybody has their throwing programs over the break and maybe their swing programs, but we've created a program to where we have our, our hitting and defensive things that we'd like to see you do on your own. Uh, and if you want to do that, great, but communicate with us and, and let us give you some feedback if you want it. Um, and I think we're really excited to see where that's going to go. But I think the last thing that I would add to that is in everything that we do, I believe in is you said it, but it's clarity. Um, even if you look at our, our pitchers checklist over the break, if you look at our hitters um, worksheets over the break, 
skill desired or what do you need to work on? It needs to be three words or less. You know, that hitter needs to think about stay in the box, separate the hands, rotation. Because we we all just give our kids way too much because um, there's so much out there. And yep. simplifying things gives you an opportunity to really come back and say, hey, coach, I'm rotating better or mm -hmm. I gained 10 pounds, you know, and uh, it's a mistake sure. I've we've all made those mistakes. You know, you give your right. guys too much and hey, you need to do this, 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 and this. And next thing you know, there's no drive. It's like, I, I know for me, if I have too much right. on my plate, I just say, screw it. And I'm out. You know, I need to be, need to be specific on what we're doing. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, I had a friend who made this transition in, in the private sector. And so, you know, in the role that I'm in, we have about, I think six coaches. And so, I've kind of taken a step back and gone to more of the approach side of things and which is a little bit out of my element. And I've, I'll tell you what, I have loved it because it's no longer trying to fix something constantly. It's trying to figure out how, what you already have to a certain extent works or doesn't. So then it will lead to more of those conversations about, okay, you know, why is this happening? Why can you not, uh, why can you not drive a fastball to the right center field gap and then stay on plane with a curveball? Like what, you know, what causes that? And then it leads more to, you know, some mechanical tweaks and different routines and things like that. But it's just, I, for me, it, it, it opens up a lot of doors and a lot of conversations because it's no longer my opinion or the tech's opinion or someone else's opinion versus, you know, what they believe in. It's now more of a conversation about, okay, how do we, how do we get you really good with what you've got right now? And then we can always make small adjustments. And, uh, you know, the feedback that I'm getting is it's, it's, they, I don't, I don't want to say it's, you know, I think it's refreshing for them just because I think you're right. They're inundated with so many things that they're doing quote unquote wrong, especially high school kids and college kids who are going to school all day and then only seeing the things that they get wrong on their papers. But I, I don't know, like it, it's been an interesting conversion for me just because, you know, five or six years ago, I was, you know, very heavy into mechanics and I still like that aspect of it. But I feel like the, you know, once we, all of us coaches went all in on that, then it's kind of shifted to where, okay, these, these guys need more of that game planning approach, situational awareness, strike zone awareness, decision-making type things. And I, have you seen that transition too, or am I crazy? We've made it. I've made it myself okay. as a hitting coach. I've been a hitting coach for good goodness, a uh, long time. I don't want to, I still look fairly averagely young so but uh <laughs> no but yeah I, I i had a booklet at hawaii back in 2003 2004 that i you know i made up my hitting manual and i i still tell our kids and joke about it with our coaches but i think i had like 12 checkpoints to the slot position and they're all critical they, they're you know well that, that's a lot but there are all things that you can point out, you know, what's, what's a proper entry into the swing. What does that look like? Where's the weight distribution? Where's the bat? Where's the elbow? How tight are we? But mm -hmm. the kids don't need to know that. Right. And so to, to, to comment or answer your question is I've totally made that room or that move into mechanics are simple. Um, you know, there are four basic checkpoints of the swing. Um, we're going to spend a lot of our time on being very, very, very specific on drills or we're not doing that. There's a, if there's a drill and there's a purpose to the drill, if you do it and close your eyes and put the proper concentration into it over the course of the next eight weeks, your mm -hmm. swing will just develop. So I have absolutely found that our fall every year gets really fun um, and gets really energized at the end, not only because we're playing, um, but we, because we're mechanically based, we're, we're doing those things that you're, you're talking about, but you know, our drills are, there's a lot of moving pieces We're we're practicing, it's not just practicing hitting a curveball. It's practicing hitting a curveball. Oh, oh, it's practicing sure. hitting a curveball one, one. It's practicing hitting right. a curveball two strikes. And, and that literally that your decision making and, and when you, where you want to get the bat, uh, same thing, neutral counts, two strikes, all those things. It becomes really fun. Um, sure. And then, then you start to get into timing mechanisms and rhythm mechanisms. And, and those are mm -hmm. the things that when your guys start to blow up, you know, but, but there does have to be a, a great foundation of swing. Sure. But I, though I have moved into simplify, clarify, very easy checkpoints, a lot of big league pictures, a lot of big league videos. Don't cookie cut your players. Figure out right. what they are. Give them the basic movements. Are they close? 
and then we spend all of our time on, on rhythms and movements and that's just relationship based too. That's why I think when you look at our, what we've evolved into of what we do, how we do it, mm -hmm. uh, culture is first because this is program one. This is mm -hmm. the program. This is how we act. This is the expectation. If you don't do this, you're not going to be around here. Uh, and then mechanically based, these are the expectations mechanically. Um, but again, these are, these aren't changes yet. You know, changes occur when we move into approach mode because unless we've had conversations with recruits that we've had committed for two or three years, it's not fair to a player to see him for two weeks and, you sure. know, jerk, jerk him around, make changes, mm -hmm. you're setting him up for failure. And you're setting yourself up as a coach for him to lose trust in you. Would you, before we, we move on to the, the approach side, uh, could you share with us, you know, your four checkpoints and then some of the drills that you really like? Yeah. Um, you know, the, starting with just, I think of the four things of the swing, um, you know, the two areas, maybe three, two and a half, um, that we find ourselves working on with, with high school hitters all the time is just number one, not enough kids stride separate. So for us, it's rhythm stride separation. That's number one, but, but that is such an important, not a kid, not enough kids, not enough hitters are separating their hands. Everybody's really tight. Um, everybody is dumping uphill, downhill. So anyways, rhythm, stride, separation, those are critical, but making sure that those hands have some movement. Sure. Look at big league hitters. You see a lot of movement when they stride. There's a, there's a something there that's very important. That's key one. Key two is the launch position. You know, that, that moment where your feet are both grounded, but where you can take a picture. And we have a lot of kids these days with launch angle, um, you know, that are too far on their backside. So they're really swinging uphill and that's fine on a pitch that's down, but there's a lack of understanding of where contact point is, in my opinion. So uh, rhythm stride separation, uh, launch position two. Uh, the, the third piece is the, the entry, which we call slot entry, which is working from the ground up and getting your bat, you know, early initially into the hit zone. And then fourth for us is contact extension. And um, we just don't spend a lot of time on extension. We don't spend a lot of time on contact. I'm a believer that if you can get your guys to, have rhythm and separate, have a clean launch position and understand that we can work from the ground up and when we begin rotation, take a peek at that slot and what it looks like. I think it's at that point, most of your hitters mechanically can close their eyes and have a pretty decent swing. So, um, so all of our sure. drills are yeah, based sure. on those things. So like, you know, I said the first two keys are critical or the first two and a half are critical. Well, so rhythm stride separation drills, you know, we do feet together, hands down at the belt, stride feel your foot go that way feel your hands go up that way you've created some separation um you know stop start stuff where you stride and stop you're on the toe you maybe for clutch rhythm but the the front heel goes down the back heel comes up the hands still remain back you know that's a really good launch position move uh that same drill applies to if you take that one step further entering into the slot and stopping um and then rotating from there the walkthrough drill uh, they're the happy Gilmore drill for us. I'm a really, I love drills that start with your hands at your belt. Um, whether you leg lift or stride or toe tap, I really like that. Uh, cause it promotes this sure rhythm. And mm -hmm. so many of us do this these days. Uh, so we really try to get their hands up. So we really try to promote in our drills. So the walkthrough would be a third one, a very popular one for us is just cool. Start with your hands down at your belt, you know, and right, left, go. Um, and I think the one thing I would add mechanically that's any of us can do, uh, you know, we did it in New Mexico state outside and is just go to target and buy 10 mirrors, eight bucks, put them behind your catch nets and let your guys hit into those nets where they've got some feedback visually. I know, you know, us at the power five level are very fortunate with the indoor facilities that we have. But the first thing that I did when we got the job was that we just mirrored one side of our cage. And we turned that into a T station. We flipped our nets around and all of our T's, all of our throwing is into a net looking at ourselves. And I think that visual feedback is really important. Yeah, no, no doubt. And, uh, I, I love that. So $8 mirrors, I'm gonna have to look into that. <laughs> they really are. Now, the they might that... have, they might have flowers on them. So <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Paint. We'll just yeah. spray paint. Them. Yeah, no yeah. doubt. So, uh, question for you too, because I know around here Gary Ward is a big influence uh, from from Oklahoma State, and I, I don't I don't know if you guys overlapped at, or not at all, but it, it still seems like he's influencing, and, and he was way ahead of his, of his time for sure. Way but ahead. Did he have any influence on you? 
probably the number one influence on me as a really? coach. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah, That's um, I remember and he's a legend, you know, and the cool thing is he's an Aggie also, as am I. So, um, you know, he was there for, what, 10, 11 years with him and Rock. Sure. And um, But, no, I'll never forget being at the ABCA convention and watching Coach Ward talk about hitting. And I was, I don't know, 24, 25 is my first one. And, you know, he's just – this is this is way too quick zone one and oh my god this is way too much but the thing that i took away from it um it was my first convention is completely blown away but watching a guy with a legitimate hitting system and understanding the value of a proper drill the the, the amount of repetition involved in that drill which will change your swing but i just i'll never forget going from a to b to c to d um and being blown away with that he that was essentially the my first ever experience in watching somebody talk about hitting was, was Gary Ward at the ABCA convention. Um, you know, the, the concept of what coach talked about with the slot position to this day from the belt up is still, <laughs> I mean, everybody teaches that, you know, or I certainly teach it, but shaft to shoulder, you know, the bat is tight, the elbow is tucked, the barrel is behind or above the hands or flat. It's close, but we're not dumping. I mean, that concept has never changed. And I think he really, um, he made coaching very systematic and a uh, big influence on my life for sure. Oh, that's great. I, I actually had a friend who recommended that I think during COVID and I went back and watched it and it was probably, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago. And I was like, wow, he's talking about a lot of concepts that we, you know, we're still trying to figure still out. Still the now, same. But it's, it's, it's yeah. pretty cool. And yeah, boy, they get hit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. one of my favorite things was, was he was talking about how when a guy warmed up, they would have all of his team come out in front of the dugout and and like time the guy up right in front of him just so they could all see it. And I was like, oh yeah. So me as like a you know uh, a freshman coach or whatever I was at the time, uh, I tried to do that. And the umpire was like, get back in there. I was like, oh, sure. Dang, there yeah, goes my, my big plan. No, that intimidation no, stuff. That's pretty good. Yeah. 